My name is Bridget O'Reilly. I'm a first year nursing major in the Penusca College of Professional Studies. I'm also an assistant at the Slattery Center for the Ignatian Humanities. As I prepare for my career in the medical world, I realize every day that my life will forever be a mix of science and the humanities. Care of personalis is one of the Jesuit ideals that inspires the care of the whole being in person. This has influenced how I see my future career tremendously. This is the greatest gift of a Scranton education. My humanities training here is clearly going to make me a better nurse. I did not know who Dr. Edmund Pellegrino was until this year, but now as I learn about him and his work, he inspires my career in an even bigger way. Tonight, we have the honor of hosting Catherine Brown Saltzman, a nationally renowned leader in the fields of nursing and healthcare ethics. She served as a palliative care nurse, a bioethics researcher and scholar, a professor of nursing at UCLA, the founder of the annual National Nursing Ethics Conference, the creator of several popular and life-changing retreats and workshops for healthcare providers, and the founder and longtime director of the UCLA Health Ethics Center. Our moderators tonight are Professor Kim Subasic, the chair of our nursing department, and Professor Matthew Shea, an assistant professor of philosophy who focuses in part on medical ethics. Thank you for attending, and I hope this conversation enriches you. I will now turn the mic over to Professor Subasic and Professor Shea. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bridget. The life of Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, who passed away in 2013 at the age of 93, would be hard to summarize in a few hours, let alone a few minutes. Called the father of modern medical ethics, Pellegrino was a giant in the fields of bioethics, clinical medicine, medical education, and the health humanities. He was a physician who practiced medicine his entire professional life for more than 65 years, a professor of medicine and medical ethics at Georgetown University, a prolific scholar who authored over 600 articles and 23 books, an academic administrator who served as a department chair, dean, vice chancellor, and university president, the director of multiple ethics centers, including the renowned Kennedy Institute of Ethics and the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics at Georgetown, and a public servant who was chair of the President's Council on Bioethics. Tom Beecham, himself a fellow giant of bioethics, said after Pellegrino's death, without being disrespectful of the many celebrated figures from Hippocrates to Percival, my view is that no physician has been more productive in the field or made a greater contribution than Ed. This inaugural lecture series is named in honor of Edmund Pellegrino because he's a beacon of how the humanities and Catholic and Jesuit values can enrich and transform healthcare and can be put in the service of humanity. His philosophy resonates strongly with the mission of the University of Scranton and the Slattery Center for Ignatian Humanities, especially in terms of the commitment to contemplation and action, a classical liberal arts education, and the holistic intellectual, professional, moral, and spiritual formation of students. He also shared the commitment to finding God in all things and to being a person for others. Reflecting on his own professional calling, Pellegrino said, for the Christian doctor, medicine is always more than a career or occupation. It is truly a vocation, a response to a divine call to manifest God's love for others through fulfilling the obligations of a medical life. Pellegrino has been a formative influence on numerous faculty members, administrators, and students here at the U. And our hope is that this annual lecture series will enable his work, life, and example to continue to inspire and instruct our community. In preparing for this event, I asked Dr. Joseph Rejo, a clinical ethicist at UCLA and a friend of mine and Catherine's, who worked with Pellegrino on the President's Council, what made Pellegrino so special? He pointed me to an interview that Pellegrino gave near the end of his life. When he was asked about his view of the relationship between medicine, science, and the humanities, Pellegrino answered like this. It is my strong belief that perhaps now more than ever, there needs to be an intercommunication of the humanities and the sciences. Medicine is the most scientific of the humanities and the most humane of the sciences. It bridges the physical state of the human being with her psychological state, and I dare say with her spiritual state, however we define that to be. I think we must bring together the science of the human with what it is to be a good human being and what is the good for humans. Toward this end, the humanities are as important as the sciences. I can think of no better way than Pellegrino's remarks to highlight the value of this lecture series. 
And with that, let's move on to the main event, our conversation with Catherine Brown Salzman. I know she has some issues with the term healthcare hero, but Catherine is a mentor, role model, and hero of mine. And we're very honored and lucky to have her with us tonight. Hi, Catherine. I'm gonna start with a question for you, if I may. So um, we, are, we are very glad to have you with us tonight. So I'd like to start our conversation with, with a question regarding um, your, the start of your career. So you received your BSN, your Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from Marquette University. Um, and I'd like to know, can you tell us how um, a Jesuit foundation influenced your collegiate career? You know, I don't think I even fully appreciated it in the beginning, right? Going back that many years. I, but it's only now, each step of the way that you look back over your shoulder and you go, oh, that's how I arrived here, right? It was um, clearly, uh, I came from a Catholic tradition and I did not go uh, to Catholic school when I was younger. Um, and so to be immersed in that kind of environment and to really have this sense of between nursing and the Ignatian philosophy, this idea of to serve, to love, um, to really be reflective in your life and your calling. So it, it had a profound effect and continues to in my life. And I, I truly appreciate it more now than I think I ever did. Um, can you transition, uh, or sorry, can you provide a description of your transition from bedside nurse to becoming an expert in healthcare ethics? So I think that, uh, I always have trouble with these words, expert, right? <laughs> I, I think we, we are always becoming and hoping to be experts. But um, I clearly, I mean, when I first went into my very first nursing uh, position, which was with pediatric oncology. And immediately there were the ethical issues and they followed me everywhere, right? Uh, certainly into end of life. And that um, provoked clearly those hard questions and um, not easy answers. And ultimately I, uh, I actually had too many things going with the palliative care and, um, the, the self-care work that I was doing, some research, but ethics was always there. And then, uh, you know, I was chairing a nursing ethics committee at UCLA and then co-chairing the ethics committee and uh, I had really the privilege with others to co-found the center. And um, it, it became very clear to me that I needed to hone down what I was doing, especially in, in those final years of intense work, it was the question, what ought I be doing right now? So really um, pruning, pruning that incredible field and figuring out uh, where to focus. And it felt as though ethics had been such a piece thread throughout the tapestry of my life that, uh, and my work that I thought this, this is the time to really focus on that. And I had that great opportunity. Catherine, can you talk a little bit about your own experience with the humanities and how great books and art um, has shaped you as a healthcare professional? And um, I'll say for the audience, you're a poet uh, in, your, in your spare time. Um, and so if, that, if you wanna talk about how that's influenced your work as well. Sure. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, that's, that would be a great Pellegrino question, right? Because I, I think he truly recognized that um, if, if, I mean, this, you're, in a sense, you're so split, right? You have this, it's almost like being schizophrenic in some ways, the sciences, which make you a bit of a skeptic. And then you have this other piece, the human flourishing, right? And so to, to have the privilege of, for example, having a liberal arts education along with my nursing clearly opened that part of me. And um, so all of those pieces, uh, the, the literature certainly, the poetry has been very profound for me. 
I'm married to a uh, musician, composer, music editor. And I think that was a bit intentional uh, to enrich my life in that way and balance my life in that way, uh, to bring that into my life. Um, so I think that all of those pieces had, uh, and continue, I will say, didn't just, they weren't just at one time in my life, they've continued to grow. It's funny because as I was thinking about this, one of the, the things that I read uh, during my junior high years was uh, Death Be Not Proud. And a very profound book. And I, I really believe that that's one of the reasons that I chose nursing. Um, so I think these books truly can guide us um, and really help us discover and, and also the spiritual books, right? That, that open us up and bring that reflective place. Um, but even fiction, right? How it, it I think it, it can enter you in a different way. Um, so when you read nonfiction, it's, it's, you're right there with it. But when you read nonfiction, when you read a novel that brings you into that emotional life in a different way, and it creates that perspective of being outside of oneself and hearing the different voices. So I think it's it's just critical that we, uh, Pellegrino, that he was devoted to that, right? Yeah. Catherine, I find your use of the word that the book, that we enter into the book, that we enter into the conversation that's occurring within the book, and I guess within your mind as well. So um, you, you referred to, um, Death Be Not Proud. Do you have others that you you consider your top favorites and how yeah. they might have influenced you? Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about a, uh, certainly a spiritual book. Um, Kathleen Norris's work uh, had a, just a wonderful, um, I try to get to the monastery every year and uh, her work when I came upon it was Whew. It, it just helped me find another access point to my spirituality. Okay. Thank you. So I guess, I guess this is a time we should start to transition over to some of the, um, how you discovered Edmund Pellegrino into your, your world of action and where that took off. So can you tell us where that first start um, began? I had the privilege of attending the uh, Georgetown uh, Bioethics Intensive course. And of course he was there. Uh, and that, that was a huge transition for me. Um, and and uh, to be amongst those Right, that were such leaders in bioethics. And I think, you know, I, I've been in secular institutions in terms of my work. So to have that um, environment, which was very inclusive, but clearly uh, stemming from a Catholic tradition, um, it, it really had an effect to, to hear him. We also had the wonderful opportunity of having him come uh, and, and speak at the UCLA Ethics Center. And again, that was um, such a gift because it was a very up close experience of meeting him um, and coming to know him. And, you know, he was, he was an elder at that point, right? And yet he was so, um, so clear and so present, uh, just as I think he was in all of his career, all of his, he wouldn't call it a career, <laughs> all of his devoted work. Um, so I had, you know, it was, it, I had those very special opportunities. And then of course, out of that, the opportunity to read more and to fully appreciate his spirit um, and his wisdom and what he brought to bioethics. Yeah. Yeah, so Catherine, you mentioned the importance of spirituality in your own 
um, work and life. And uh, you man mentioned also the kind of secular healthcare setting, right? Which you've worked in um, for the majority of your career, <laughs> um, your service. So would you be able to speak, kind of jumping ahead a little bit to the special kinds of challenges that religious healthcare professionals might face working in a secular environment, which a lot of them will find themselves in and the one that you found yourself in. Would you be able to, to shed some light on that, the kinds of challenges and maybe how you um, grappled with those? Sure, that's a good question. And I, I think, you know, there, um, there were times because actually all my experiences were in secular environments other than when I was being educated. Um, and there were times when I thought, gosh, I've kind of chosen a hard, root here, right? Because to, to be in an institution that is uh, driven by uh, religious tradition, for example, I think has, uh, the values are out there, they wear them on their sleeves. And so um, I think going into secular environments, there is this sense of really being careful, right? Um, and there are not necessarily the outer signs there to, to guide you uh, in the everyday practice. So for me, I, um, because I deeply integrated my spirituality. So for example, uh, when I was a clinical nurse specialist in palliative care, and I would go to enter a room and press open that room or knock on that door, there was always this sense of just pause for one moment and be reflective and ask for blessings as I enter this room. Ask for knowledge that I can't possibly have and paying attention and being alert and intuitive and to really be present in a different way. So I think that that was the easier part. Uh, the harder part was uh, as people began to notice the, my approach, I think it took me a while to realize that I could kind of come out and really talk about my spirituality and talk about my experiences um, with those patients. And I think that because my spirituality was so important, that formation, that my vocation, that it, it was integral across the board. So it was whatever I was doing, um, those values were there on the table and it began to be recognized. And I think uh, the funniest moment for me um, in my career in terms of spirituality was when someone essentially pointed to me and said, oh, Catherine should handle that because it's a spiritual issue. And I, I was a little shocked because I realized at that point that I really had become known. But it's not, it's not necessarily an easy thing because you are, um, you are carrying a lot and you, particularly when you move into more administrative roles uh, you, you walk this very fine balance of, of integrating, keeping intact all those traditions that have come behind you, right? And you bring forth. Catherine, how do you, um, how do you bracket those, those feelings? How do you, uh, what advice would you give to new, new graduates uh, of our program going out into the healthcare setting, how do you bracket those, those paths when you're dealing with um, a difficult patient or a patient that um, may be in the hospital, but they're under, they're, they're under circumstance in which you don't um, align with, you know, whether it be a prisoner or some other, some other avenue. Yeah. How, how do you tend to those and, and keep that spiritual awareness? Well, I think um, in, in some ways that's the easy part because you, you, are, you are called to love, you are called to serve. And um, I always found what some people call challenging patients to be not challenging as much as to be understood, 
to be heard. And so for me, it was always about, let me hear their story. Let me find out what's happening here. And there was always a story that would literally just break open an empathic heart and, you know, and then you could, and then you could process it and you could be really creative in how you responded. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'll tell you where I had a hard time bracketing it was when either healthcare or an individual practitioner did not demonstrate respect or love or skill. Um, and then I, then I would have to say nasty things to myself <laughs> about such you know, showing up in that way. Um, so it's not, it's not that I don't have those raw feelings, but from, I can't ever remember, honestly, a patient that I didn't find a way into my heart with. And I think that that's, you know, if you, if you're in very intentional, uh, it's, it, it becomes very easy. It's that, you know, and I think Pellegrino would say that too. It's it's those eyes wide open, right? It's it's the intentionality. It's the looking for it. It's the relational piece. It's that we're we come into this our raw humanity, right? Um, theirs and ours, as well as our colleagues. We're all bringing it to the table. How do you how do you bounce around that um, when when we have these time constraints? No, no matter who you are in healthcare, anywhere from the dietitian on up, um, we are all under extreme tight constraints. So how do you how do you find time to get to that person to to really understand where their start point is and what their true needs are? What's your advice there? I will tell you, I I, I get it. I felt like I never had time, right? Uh, so I get that. But I, I also think that if we have this sense of taking time, and when we take time, we enter into relationship and we build trust. And once that happens, and that can happen in minutes through your body language, through your connecting with the eyes. If you walk in there and you are fully present, what you can accomplish in, in minutes is astonishing. I also think it's bigger than us. So that's another piece of my spirituality. I think when I carried it all on my own shoulders for years and years and led to burnout, um, I began to realize, you know, there's more to this. It's not just me showing up. And in fact, um, I, at one time when I was quite burned out, and doing everything possible to refuel myself, the, the reading of good literature, the, you know, the music, the poetry, whatever, just feeding myself, right? Being out in nature, um, going to church, prayer, all those things. I was in church this one time, just, uh, just I didn't even, couldn't even pick myself up. I was just so despondent about the fatigue and, and just stretched. And uh, they were reading the old story that we've heard a million times, right? About, you know, the, the loaves and the fish. And I remember sitting there kind of with my head just down and my head just sitting up because I'd heard that story a million times. And suddenly it was like, oh my God, I'm the loaves, I'm the fish. And there's only one of me. So I need to incorporate this idea of blessing that my life, my work, my showing up in that moment is, all, I can only give you this much. Some days I can, oh, some days I'm full and radiant. I can give you everything, but other days I I can just give a little bit. And this recognition that they're to call on others uh, and to call on God to bless that and multiply it. and. It's pretty astonishing when you open yourself in that way, right? Yeah, that leads to another um, thought, Catherine, that maybe you can speak to. So you've talked a lot about how your spirituality comes into play in the patient facing side of things. Um, and I'm wondering, since you've done a lot of work in moral distress and burnout and self-care for 
providers. What about um, kind of providers taking care of them, their own selves in terms of spiritual practices throughout the day or the idea of taking time for a Sabbath or kind of a rest or the kind of um, professional facing side of things? Could you say a little bit about that dimension? Yeah, I, it's just, it's so critical and it's, um, it's so difficult. So this idea that we never have time, right? And we, we have to dedicate ourselves essentially uh, to taking that time and recognizing it's, it's in a sense, a lot of people, the way they justify it to do self-care to honor themselves is to say, well, this, this way I'll be a better nurse or I'll be a better physician or better parent or whatever. But the truth of the matter is I'll be a better person <laughs> and, and that we deserve to be able to show up in that way and to be better people for ourselves and in the world. So I think even that perspective of not just doing it for the other, but that we are given this one gracious life and it should be well lived, right? So I, um, I will tell you in the work that I have done, the healing work uh, with healthcare professionals, it has astonished me the pain that they carry and this sense of never having an opportunity um, or taking the opportunity to do reflective practice, to think about what they're doing, to feel the grief, to honor it, to, um, to forgive themselves for the times that, you know, I, how often have I heard someone say all the things they didn't do and never mention all that they did do in a given day, right, to care for others. So, um, but again, I think that it's really in, in the retreat work that I did, we really integrated the arts, um, movement, dance, uh, art, meditation, uh, spirituality, because I think that often healthcare professionals, that is not integrated into their lives. So um, it's, I think that's a, a critical piece. And I, I think that our institutions are not very good at this. I'm really hoping that um, as we move out of this pandemic, that we as a society and as institutions begin to recognize. Um, President Biden just, I loved what he said about uh, putting funding into the infrastructure. And he talked about the infrastructure not just being bridges, but people people that care for children, the people that are uh, caretakers of the elderly. And I think that that's the kind of shift that will begin to honor and not, not as we said, not just call them heroes, but to really honor these people and recognize their, their own humanness and their own needs. Catherine, you, you led me to a thought as you were talking about that. And I was going to ask you a question about COVID, but you, you elaborated on a, a theme that is all too common in nursing that we go home at the end of the day, just feeling like we didn't do enough or pure exhaustion, but feeling that, oh my gosh, I needed to do that. So in, in the book, The Helping and the Healing, um, I think one of what the, I really, really enjoyed reading this book in preparation for our um, discussion, but um, Dr. Pellegrino mentions the healer is bound to the sick person. And if this element in the relationship is broken down, that, that then there's, there's, there's just a continued fallout. And I feel that that is some of what you elaborated to. And I, I'm just curious, um, do, are you aware of, of um, nursing in medical institutions, actually, not just nursing, but are you aware of healthcare institutions that have already taken that step that you referred to that, that have rooms for, D, say, uh, healthcare decompression following a code, you know, where, where once, once that's all done, there's a flood of emotions that happen. Like, are there places that um, have allowed opportunities while you're working for healthcare staff to go decompress, to, to take care of themselves. Can you yeah. elaborate on those? Yeah, I, th I think that many institutions are beginning to do that. 
I think what happens though is that in in the process, uh, there there often isn't talk about not having time, right? There's another patient coming through those doors into that bed, right? And so there's at best, perhaps, even if those facilities are available, at best, there's just a moment and then it's moving on. Um, and we certainly saw this even escalated during the pandemic, right? That, that they're literally uh, the level of exhaustion, the level of not, not even having the moment. So um, I think that's why in some ways, when I did this retreat work, it was about taking people out of the institution, right? It was taking them for an entire weekend to, to build the skills, but also to have that place to let down, to be cared for. And so I think that while we can build some of that in, the, the logistics are such that we also know how efficiently these institutions have to run as businesses. And so um, let's face it, we are, we are seeing nurses even being laid off during the pandemic, right? Uh, so pediatric nurses, for example, in some institutions were literally being laid off. So there's this sense of, we only need you when we need you. Right. So we have to we have to round out our institutions to not be so so lean and mean. We have to recognize that, for example, perhaps people in healthcare need sabbaticals, and that they could take on a project even for six weeks or a month that would be filling them up, um, exposing them, getting them out of the intensity of the environment exposing them to an, a, a whole new framework with support and accomplishing good things for the institution and for patient care. But we don't think that way, right? In fact, we call nurses up and we cancel them. Mm -hmm. That's routine. That happens all the time in our institutions. And it's wrong. It's just, it's not, it's not a professional way to respond, but it's become the norm. So I think it, Kim, it really is going to take, and I, I'm actually hoping that the pandemic, the ashes of the pandemic gives people the opportunity to step back and reflect on really what, what are the ethical practices of supporting all healthcare professionals. We see it in physicians. I mean, the rate of burnout is so significant in physicians and it's not just people leaving the profession, that's bad enough. What's even worse is when we have people that have just shut down, their hearts are sealed over, they're not able to respond anymore. So they show up and they may give the medication, they may do the diagnostic test, but then nobody is home. And we all know that healing is about that relationship, showing up with the empathic presence so much healing can occur during an illness beyond the physical, right? So I think we have some soul searching to do and I think um, we shouldn't put band-aids on it. I think we really need to be reflective and responsible and accountable for how we move forward. So time is going very quickly as we knew it would. Um, I want to make sure I get to, to an ethics question. Um, so Pellegrino, as we know, was a you know, real leader in the field of medical ethics, and you've worked in that area for a long time. So from your perspective, what are some of the moral problems or challenges or things that need to be improved in terms of both the clinical setting, but also the education of healthcare professionals, and then maybe some some ways that we might go about improving some of those things. Sure. Um, so I think that education is still truly lacking and, and it, it's not just education, but good education, right? So for example, so often what we're seeing in um, schools, people are just taught the principles, right? And the rules. And Pellegrino would have something to say about that, wouldn't he? <laughs> that that uh, it's it's so much bigger than that. When we ask these questions, what we ought to do. So 
I think part of it is that we need a, a better way of finding and preparing faculty to really teach good solid ethics, right? Um, and that we're not there yet. So often what happens, somebody is grabbed to fill in to teach ethics, right? Not that they necessarily have either the clinical experience of it or the, the philosophy, the, what is truly needed. So I think that that's part of it. Um, I think the, the moral questions, clearly in the last years, we have seen that some of the toughest cases involve treatment that professionals believe is not only inappropriate treatment in an ICU, for example, but is uh, harmful treatment. And uh, we're talking typically at end of life um, with great suffering, um, uh, great suffering, not only for the patient, but for all those witnessing the family, uh, the, the clinicians, the housekeeper, everyone. Um, so I think that that has been a major issue that we're still struggling with uh, how to be how to be accountable in how we utilize all of our technology and our, our possibilities, but how to do that in a way that we don't harm, deeply harm, especially at the end of life. Um, but then there are everyday ethical questions, right? So for example, during the pandemic, one of the things people were focusing on was again, the sense of, um, you know, how, how do we, if we run out of ventilators, right? I, I was always saying, I'm more worried about running out of the nurses, but you know, okay, we'll, we can focus on ventilators. But you know, when you look at the ethical issues, they're not always the big, huge issues like that. What I saw during this was nurses that had to lower their standard of care. Literally, they had something that they value that is, is just a given in their everyday practice. And they, they were forced by necessity to lower the standard of care. And so what do we do about that? And how do we help people to heal from that, right? And how do we also reorient them in that way? I, if, if we have time, I'd like to share one story um, that I think perhaps will we'll bring, uh, we'll bring to light how we can show up every day in ways that we don't expect in healthcare. Do we have time for that? Yes. Okay. So I was going to do an ethics consult on a liver unit, adult liver unit. And I get there and the patient, uh, because of being encephalopathic was uh, not able to engage at all. And I it just didn't have the capacity to have that conversation. And so it was the end of the day, I was pretty tired and feeling like, well, that's good, I can go home. And I'm walking down the hallway and I hear screams. I mean, blood curdling screams. And I realized it was a child, not an adult. So I stopped and I thought, okay, this isn't even my unit. I don't belong here. I should just keep walking. And it was like, no, no, I can't do that. And so I walked to the door, took a deep breath. The screaming was continuing and I knocked on the door and entered. And there was a child there. Uh, 12 year old child who it turned out had fallen through uh, glass uh, and been cut practically their entire body and had been treated and fortunately had survived, but had sutures all the way down their body and trauma. She was a beautiful, beautiful girl. And what was happening was the physical therapist was there to get her to ambulate, to walk. And this little girl was absolutely terrified. And no matter the cheerleading from her parents and the physical therapist, she could not leave that chair. And um, I sat down, I actually crouched down, got down on my knees, squatted and looked her in the eye. And I just began to talk to her 
about how frightened she was, how terrified she was, and that she might even be terrified that if she got up and walked that her whole body would fall apart. So we know from child development that someone at 12 doesn't think that way, but we all regress, right? And we remember the toddler who thinks that they can fall apart, literally. And just reaching and making, and that's, we talked about Kim not having time, right? Within moments with eye contact and gentle touch and really being empathic, this child connected and I was able to really coach her and not in a, not in a rah, rah way, but in a sense of understanding what she had been through and how that fear was keeping her from being able to move and how we could, we could take care of that hurt in her. We could talk about that and we could reassure her that she was gonna be whole again and that we could just, all she had to do, she didn't have to walk across the room. She could stand. She didn't even have to take one step. Just standing was enough. So I think I, when I reflected upon that story recently, I think what it speaks to is being called. And we think sometimes that we're being called to certain things, right? I'm there to do an ethics consult. That's where I think we have to open our hearts and our minds, our spirits. And we really in healthcare need to show up where we are called to in that moment and trust how we are called. Um, that little girl later in an outpatient visit told me about how she was gonna go into healthcare um, someday. And you know, that's what healing is about, right? That was the healing moment for her of just bringing it together in a way that she could feel safe, safe enough to take a step, which she did. Catherine, can I, can I backtrack to, uh, previously you mentioned you, you, were, um, you worked in a pediatric oncology floor. And certainly with any type of nursing you're, you're, or any kind of healthcare, you're, you're tending to the family, but I think in nursing more so than some other healthcare professions. So my question to you is in a pediatric oncology, tending to a sick child is difficult period, um, but then to have the family and anybody else that might be involved in that. Um, how, how did you work through that? What, what was your source of staying focused and, and keeping yourself well, well and healthy in the meantime? Yeah, you know, I think that with um, parents, we have to recognize, I mean, their job, what they see their job is, is to protect a child, right? And so that's the lens they're looking through. And that can make it difficult when you're um, either doing things that are hurtful, right? Difficult for a child. Um, it can also be difficult at end of life when parents really can't come to terms with allowing death, right? So again, I think that um, you have to enter into that place of really understanding what these parents are going through and um, allowing, you know, allowing the fact that their pain is so immense because their one job in life that they see is essential, has been brutally um, taken away from them in many ways. And there's all those spiritual issues also, right? Because it's a child. And so, how, you know, if we ask the, the basic question, how could God do this? Mm -hmm. You know, how? Explain this one to me, with the suffering of a child. And so there's so much going on there. And I think um, for me, working with those parents, it, it really was helping them to focus on how they could love their child. So constantly bringing them back to not what they couldn't do, what they weren't able to do, but what they could bring to their child and what, how they could change what was happening by their bringing their love 
and how important that was and not dismissing that, really honoring it. Uh, so I think whenever you're doing that kind of work, very conscious, deliberate, assessing heart work, right? You, I think uh, it's not that you don't witness the suffering, but I think you become a part of it in a way, you're not fixing it, you're entering it and you're being with it. And you find ways to help people through that, um, that in the end, they're a little bit more whole despite the terrible things that happen. Catherine, how did you, so that's really intriguing to me that you mentioned um, healthcare providers really facing the problem of evil in a really direct way um, and witnessing intense suffering. So in your experience, how have, how is your spiritual life um, and your religious tradition and the humanities prepared you to kind of witness suffering and enter into it and also to maybe try to alleviate it if possible? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think um, probably a breakthrough moment was when I realized that I could be enraged. And um, I decided that uh, to be in relationship with God meant that he got to get all of me, not just the side that I wanted him to see, that he could, uh, he could experience my secret self, which can be pretty angry. And so I, I can remember the first time that I had a very honest conversation with God, uh, demanding, not just being furious, but demanding uh, some, some answers. And- um, like Job, Very Job-like. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, honestly, um, he's never disappointed me. When I, have, when I have reached that breaking point, there has, and this is where I think being aware and awake, um, you know, we say, well, what are the miracles today? Well, they're, they're all over the place. But when you're aware and you're awake and you're looking, we are often given at those breaking moments, we are given that perfect sign, that perfect, um, I remember driving home from the hospital where a young man was dying, a young adolescent, and his parents were divorced. And they were in this room over his bed, and it was just awful. And I had to leave because I was going to have dinner with my father, and I'd already put him on hold for a half an hour waiting at a restaurant. And I finally apologized to the family about leaving at such a critical time. And as I was driving, down a city street with all the lights and neon and you know bright city lights a shooting star fell literally in the in in the street and i looked at my clock in the car and i knew that that child had just died it was this and i i was praying on my way about his parents and him and that soul being given that place of permission to leave, that angst, right? And um, after dinner with my dad, I called back to the hospital and I said, um, mentioned the child's name and said, did he die? And I, they, I said, did he die? And I gave the time and they said, oh my God, Catherine, yes, that's exactly what he died. And, you know, those, those, it's those kind of things that I don't think we ask enough. I don't think we're real enough with God. And I think when we're real, he, he does truly show up and he witnesses our suffering. It's not just that we hold, he witnesses our suffering. He understands that when we're gonna show up in these ways, uh, that we also need comfort, that we also need that hand on our shoulder, but we have to ask. We have to be willing to put ourselves on the line. 
Catherine, I love that um, you mentioned that we we need to be willing to um, to let God in and let and let God be part of our life. Do you have suggestions or recommendations to others with I mean, even outside of prayer? I think you already referred to that you pray, but can you give us some more examples, some some even small suggestions for us, little bit by little bit, you know? Yes, yes. Well, I do think um, it sounds it sounds so mundane, but I will tell you, I think that we are all, particularly after this year, we're all so tight. And you, I, I know you walk through the doors of a hospital, for example, or you know, a school of medicine, school of nursing, what school of social work. Those doors open, and we walk in, and we. We're ready for the fight. We're ready to go. And so we spend so much time compressed. And if you think about a heart and a mind that can be open, we have to breathe. We have to breathe. And really, if we begin to watch ourselves, if we just scan our bodies and realize how much we're holding, that to, to open up first bodily with breath, um, you know, Espire, spirit, breath, right? It's, it's very connected. And I think that when we do that deep breath, we are able then to connect in different ways. So that's a starting point. I also think um, a lot of the work that I did with cancer patients was what I call meditative prayer and guided imagery. And the meditative prayer part of it was to put my hand on a person um, I always asked permission. I always explained what I was offering. And I would say I would get out of the way, right? So it's that idea of emptying oneself enough to let the divine come through us. And um, in that process, it was really a, a tremendous um, evolution for me of, I think, opening to what what we can be given. So for example, I would be given images in that moment and I, I would balk at them sometimes. I'd say, you've got to be kidding. What, what, I'm going to do that imagery with this patient, you know? And I would, I would give up and say, okay, all right, I'll do it. And again, this image would be just remarkable and perfectly suited for that person, even though it seemed ridiculous when I started it. So I think that, um, you know, that kind of, so prayer is often that uh, asking, often, right? But the more reflective place to be filled, to ask for the grace to be filled and allow the space to just to, to stop the asking and allow the space for our, our souls to be given the message, to be given what we need. I don't know if that's helpful, Kim, but I, I... extremely helpful. <laughs> I, I I almost wish I could say repeat that, but I I think it just comes natural to you. Um, but thank you for that guidance, um, and I, and I really hope that everybody listening can take just a pearl of wisdom from what you offered this evening. Um, there were so many, um, and and I really do thank you for your openness and your in your honesty with regards to your personal situations, um, with regard to work and just your own, just in, in your own daily being. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's, it has truly been a privilege to be able to come and, and share and to be under Edward Pellegrino <laughs> and his, how he has blessed us all with his work and his life. Yes, at this point, I don't know if there are any more questions from the audience. Um, Matt, have you, do you have any, to, a, a final question, a final closing? There are too many questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, somebody, uh, there was a question, maybe that's good, because you've told a lot of stories here tonight, Catherine, I know you have a lot more. Um, so these stories come back to you, but uh, someone from the audience asked, how do you kind of keep track of these stories do they, and when do they occur to you at particular moments or do you keep a notebook or a journal or something about them or 
how do the stories of these patients fit into your life? Because clearly you carry a lot of those with you. Uh, so I have to laugh. I never had time to journal. <laughs> uh, so I didn't write the stories down. Um, I, but they live in us, right? So some moment will happen and that patient or that family or that colleague will be right beside me. But I, I think part of that is being attentive in the moment. So I didn't even quite get this, but people used to say to me, you know, Catherine, you drive us crazy because you're so focused on whatever you're doing that you're late often. And I'm like, oh yeah, well, that's because I'm really there and I lose, I'm not in time, right? Now, there are times when we have to be on time, right? But often I will hedge a bit because if I'm driven by that watch, that means I'm not paying attention. So I think that I really trained myself to close out all of this and really be with you. And so the memory of those stories, the power of those stories, and all of you who have worked caring for others in whatever capacity know what I'm talking about. Those stories become woven into our lives. And I think we honor them when, when we recall them, both, both in terms of our own vocations and work, but also, you know, in honoring those people that interwove their lives with us. Well, Catherine, we're very grateful that you stopped to take the time to be with us tonight and to share the power of your stories. Um, we could go all night, I know, but I think uh, we have to wrap up now. So thank you, Catherine, um, for being with us and sharing your, your time and experience. And thanks to everybody for attending this event too. Yes. And thank you, Kim and Matthew. I, um, your questions were wonderful and it was really Wonderful. I wish I could have asked you a few questions. <laughs> Those of you who uh, don't know Matt and I had the great opportunity to work together as when he was a fellow with us at UCLA Ethics Center. And um, it was truly when he called me, I was going to say yes, of course. Uh, he, he deeply impressed us and we are so glad that he is with you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. We appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you.